Well, I was on the 533 from Penn Station, and the train stopped at the Maryland Avenue stop, and uh, apparently the people were scurrying from the front car, and there was a rumor there was a shooting, and about 15 minutes went by, and they let everybody off the train, and at that time the police cars appeared, and the helicopters appeared, and there appears to be five people down. It looked like a movie set, but the pandemonium and hysteria were real. The 533 out of New York's Pennsylvania station heading east to Hicksville, Long Island, was filled with rush hour commuters. Suddenly, inexplicably, as the Long Island Railroad train pulled into the quiet residential community of Garden City, a male passenger, a New York City resident, pulled out what appeared to be a 9mm handgun, began loading and firing round after round of ammunition indiscriminately, randomly. Everybody was running through the car saying, this, someone's got a gun, someone's got a gun. We were try I was trying to go see my father because he sits on this car. And uh, it, there, it was just bodies all over. Guys were shot in the head. It was disgusting. My father jumped on the guy. Or the girl next to him got blown away. It was disgusting. 15, the shots just kept going off. He wouldn't stop shooting. He just wouldn't stop shooting. One of my neighbors was uh, with next to the gunman, and uh, I was just standing with him. And uh, he said that uh, he emptied uh, his gun out, just randomly shooting people in the head and neck. Uh, he then reloaded and then uh, continued shooting uh, through the car. Uh, then my neighbor and a couple other people uh, grabbed him. For hours, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters stood by praying that their loved ones had been spared. You know, we're just waiting for a sister right now. You know, she's just she's a little upset right now to talk. Uh, she, I mean, she doesn't know. I mean, she could have could have been on any one of the carts in the train. But I stood up to um, start getting off the train, and all of a sudden, uh, some shooting was going on. We thought it was sort of like firecracker noise, and uh, gunmen started coming down the car, shooting at people, and I just crouched down under the seat and just uh, prayed, actually. It was a quite frightening, very frightening experience. The trains are running out of Garden City as usual. The passengers will never be the same. It was a somber ride in on the 831. It's actually a very, you know, very creepy feeling, even the, the next morning, just walking up to the train. I knew I would feel that way and just seeing all the passengers, you just really, you don't, just don't know what's going to happen. It's very sad because you think of all the other people in town who had family on that train, and uh, it was a terrifying experience. So when you pull in, when you pass that station, you, you just cringe. So the commuters ride the train this morning, as always, with one big difference. This time, their thoughts are on those who died on this train line just last night. Graphic reminders are everywhere. There's no ignoring what happened. Well, I'm sure there's not one person here that hasn't heard about it or thought about it when they stopped there. So you just have to keep going. Even if you're in the safest county in, in the country, it can happen on the train. It can happen while you're walking to the car. It can happen in your own house. One woman on that deadly train wouldn't talk about it and chose to ride in silence. Others went on with their daily routine, glad they didn't see the bloodshed. At the Maryland station, flyers are going out expressing the railroad's condolences for the tragedy and listing phone numbers for crisis counseling. Many who are boarding the trains today are hoping the odds are with them that such a tragedy could not hit twice. It's a one in a million thing, and I don't think it's going to happen again. Certainly, what's the chance of the same line and the same car? And you can't live your life like that. The passengers will step off their trains this afternoon with flyers in hand and railroad representatives everywhere to answer any questions they might have about last night's tragedy. But it'll be a long time before they can ride those trains without thinking of those who died here. Channel 2 News in Garden City, I'm Cindy Shu. No one at the Turner's Outdoor Shop remembers Colin Ferguson, but records, which they would not show us, definitely show that he purchased the 9mm semi-automatic handgun on May the 9th. Did you even think that there could possibly be a connection? Mm, not really, no, because there's tens of thousands of stores in the country that sell the gun. And Ferguson went through a rigorous process under California law to purchase this gun, the 15-day waiting period and the thorough background check by police departments. And if they, you hear nothing within 15 days, and he comes back and when he picks up the gun he fills out another yellow slip which stays on file here where he also says he's never been convicted of felony he's never been in a mental hospital all that kind of stuff so the, the brady bill would not have helped this because brady bill is just as a five-day wait 
Apparently, Ferguson came to the Long Beach area last April 22nd when he checked into this motel room, room number one. The man who runs the motel did not want to appear on camera, but he said that Ferguson was well-dressed and appeared like a nice guy. He checked out on May the 12th, three days after he picked up his gun. The real tragedy, of course, of what's the epidemic that's been going on in our country was again brought home to us last night in New York. Sarah Brady, one of the country's leading advocates of gun control, cited yesterday's bloody massacre as an example of the need for tougher legislation. The Brady Bill, Brady named after her husband Jim Brady, who was shot in a 1981 assassination attempt on President Reagan, was passed into law last month. While the measure is the most far-reaching gun control bill enacted in at least a decade, Jim Brady said today it was only a start. Today, we begin building on that foundation, Handgun Control Inc., has put together a package of initiative that reflects the hard work and expertise of those represented here today. With New York City's next police commissioner, William Bratton, looking on in support, the Bradys, along with other high-profile gun control advocates, unveiled a comprehensive new measure they say they'll bring to Congress next year. The public is crying out with both anguish and newfound vigor in demanding that government do all that it can to reduce gun violence. The new measure builds on the Brady Bill, making it even tougher for a gun to get into the wrong hands. The proposed law calls for a nationwide system of licensing and registration, prohibits gun possession by those convicted of violent misdemeanors, it requires gun dealers to pay an annual licensing fee of $1,000, and it bans semi-automatic assault weapons. In introducing the new measure and today, the Brady said their work is not done. When the Congress returns in January, they can once again expect to see me wheeling through the halls, a rolling reminder that we must continue to work together to make America safer for all of us and for our children. It's a mixture of gratitude, relief, and guilt at the same time. Phone calls have been pouring in at the Nassau County Mental Health Center. Workers there say most of the calls are from people who were either in the actual car where the shooting happened or the one surrounding it. People are very angry and they don't know who to be angry at, so they're angry at the railroad, the gun lobby, the world, America. They're just angry. The shooting lasted less than three minutes, but those fortunate enough to be spared are also among the unfortunate. They will probably never be able to forget those horrifying moments. The cause have been the cause of understandable anguish, the cause of panic, how long am I going to feel the way I do today, the cause of, of shock. Hofstein says she encourages people to talk to someone, anyone, about what they're feeling. We're saying to people, you know, the way you feel is really okay. That's it. That's, I mean, it was it an awful business and it was a terrible shock and um, that's a very normal response and yet we're really saying to people, you know, we hope that you'll be able to pick yourself up and go to work tomorrow, even though that's very difficult for you. That's, in this, that's what will make you feel better. And Hofstein says that even children who have only read about the tragedy or seen it on TV will probably have lots of questions and lots of fear. And she says they, too, should be talked to about what children. happened. We're saying, yes, children also need to be talked to. Don't bury this under the rug. They heard the television, too. It's real for them, too. Don't talk about it. Don't lecture. Ask them questions. You'll know what they're worried about. Make sure the questions are age appropriate and not too gory in detail. Police are revealing for the first time tonight details of the awful bloodbath, describing how Colin Ferguson first walked forward, then walked backward through the railroad car, looking passengers in the eye, shooting bullet after bullet into their heads at point blank range. A madman firing out of control never uttering a sound. He hit 23 people with bullets. The four sitting closest to him died. Police said it could have been 100. The additional ammunition was found in a bag that he had on his, on his person at that time, and those notes were found in his pocket. We had that camera with him. There were 100 additional rounds available, yes. When the train rolled to a stop at the Maryland Avenue station, the doors did not open immediately. Passengers telling me they banged hysterically, yelling, crying for help. A conductor radioed the platform. An off-duty transit cop ran aboard with handcuffs to join the three Garden City passengers who tackled the suspect. Ferguson was emotionless when led away, emotionless when walked before TV cameras today. The person who committed this crime is an animal. 
who turned that Long Island Railroad car into a death chamber. Confused notes were found scribbled in his apartment, revealing extreme hatred for a whole host of people and groups. He targets Caucasians, he targets blacks, he targets Orientals. Uh, it seems he was, had hostilities regarding a, a major portion of the population and a variety of institutions. The violence in our country, I find, is scary because all of a sudden, um, people realize, gee, this is not what you see happening other places. It, it can happen here. Kathleen Aro lives closest to the Maryland Avenue train platform in the kind of suburban neighborhood that's supposedly safe. She was trying to kill an insect on her front window when she noticed commotion at the train station. Almost simultaneously, the doorbell rang. And a woman said, uh, please let me in. There is a man shooting people on the train. That began a secession of passengers at her door, so Kathleen and husband Michael opened their door to anyone who needed help. Who really just wanted to come in the house and, and call um, a wife or a husband or, or children just to say that they, they were fine and, and they were off the train and that they'd be home as soon as possible. She says her neighbors did the same. Talking with yeah, Kathleen Aro, you quickly discover she is a thoughtful person mother of six daughters, president of the Garden City PTA. She watched the police news conference this morning and realized that America's violent troubles have literally come to her front door. As I said to someone this morning um, on the phone, a friend of mine, I said, gee, if you lived maybe in one of these housing projects in Manhattan, this could almost be a daily occurrence, that, that someone would have a gun and be shooting innocent people. You see it all the time on TV. As we talked today, she reacted emotionally to the pressures of parenting in a society that seems more violent daily. As a parent, I try to teach my children right and wrong. And it's very hard for the children because they see so many others getting away with wrong things. While investigators now try to learn everything they can about Colin Ferguson's past, it appears the people who knew him as a neighbor, living in a room in this Flatbush house, knew him very little, if at all. He was quiet, and a little quiet, you know, a little weird. I don't want to say weird, but very quiet, unusually quiet. Maybe that's the word I should use. So quiet that neighbors say he never expressed the varied hatreds and grievances that police say Ferguson had written down in rambling notes found on him after he had calmly and methodically tried to turn a commuter car into a giant coffin. Those notes and statements he allegedly made to investigators indicate the unemployed Jamaican immigrant had decided to vent his rage outside New York City because of his respect for Mayor Dinkins. But if Colin Ferguson did his deeds outside of New York City so as not to embarrass Mayor Dinkins, he came to the Garden City area for some very specific reasons. Not far from the station where he exploded in gunfire is the campus of Adelphi University, which Ferguson attended and from which he was suspended in 1991 what the university would only describe as disciplinary reasons. Before that, he had been at Nassau Community College in nearby Hempstead, where he was described as a very good student. But he left there after an altercation with a professor, apparently over a grade. Both schools among the institutions Colin Ferguson hated. He makes reference to uh, a disagreement he had at one time in the past with Adelphi University. He made reference to uh, racist faculty and the racist uh, uh, treatment that he received either while employed at, uh, at Adelphi University or as a student there. It does appear Colin Ferguson was obsessed by race, but a woman who said she is his cousin was surprised to hear he allegedly hated white people. He loved white people more than her. We always fuss with him and say, you betray your nation, you don't like her. We always said the same thing to him, so what kind of is this? No, that's ain't no like white. Not me. But Ferguson evidently also hated blacks. Some he referred to as Uncle Toms, some as conservatives, and some as so-called civil rights leaders, such as lawyer C. Vernon Mason and the Reverend Herbert Daughtry. There seemed to be no bounds to the people and institutions Colin Ferguson found reason to hate, to hate apparently without reason. David Diaz, Channel 2 News. The McCarthy family, like other families, was getting ready for Christmas. Now they are preparing for a funeral.
52-year-old Dennis McCarthy was shot and killed on the 533 yesterday. His 26-year-old son, Kevin, critically wounded. Uh, you know, we're all shocked. Dennis McCarthy's brother-in-laws told me their sister Carolyn and her husband were just beginning to enjoy their lives. The house was paid for, and their son Kevin, who lives with them, had just landed a new job as a stockbroker, following in his father's footsteps. And they just finished paying the house off, and Kevin, Dennis was, they were enjoying it. They were heavy into skiing, golf, tennis, and they were looking forward. They were very much in love. They were, they were strength with each other, and uh, it's going to be tough. Tough man, to, he's going to be missed. We're all victims. Everyone's a victim. Everyone that's listening to the broadcast, everyone that's got anything to do with it. I feel sorry for everybody that was involved. 30-year-old Marita Magatoto was involved. The 30-year-old lawyer had just landed a job with a Manhattan law firm. She was, according to her housemate, returning from that law firm when she was killed. On you. A horrible loss and a horrible time, in, time of year mm -hmm. and at a really bad time for her when her life is just getting together. Mineola, where two of the five who were killed lived, is a community tonight in shock and in mourning. It's just crushed the community. I work right across from where the train comes by every day, and I pick my husband up at night. It's just, there's like a, a veil over the community, and it's going to take a long time to get over this. Police are on guard all night where murder suspect Colin Ferguson lived in the basement apartment at 226 Martin Street. The apartment where police found rambling notes of his hate for many people, including his neighbors. Ferguson wrote, those filthy swines that live at 226 Martin Street, Brooklyn, are not my friends. Once they hear of this, they will loot all the evidence in my room, such as documents and tapes. I hate them with a passion. John Jay College professor Dr. Charles Bond works with the FBI on psychological profiling. He says Ferguson likely experienced months possibly years of slights and insults from those he felt were his enemies. It has to be preceded by months and maybe years of feeling that uh, people have insulted him in various ways, slighted him, treated him badly, and each time the rage piles on more and more. He's single, 35, unemployed, born in Kingston, Jamaica. In high school, he rated as a good student. As a student at Nassau Community College, Ferguson made dean's list as an accounting and business administration major, but he reportedly had problems with his temper. Later at Adelphi, he got in a dispute with a professor about a failing grade. Bond says it's no surprise Ferguson was a good student. It took some intelligence to realize that here's a situation in which he has a large number of people trapped together, very, very much off their guard, was quiet and a little quiet, you know, a little weird. I won't say weird, but very quiet, unusually quiet. Maybe that's the word I should use. Neighbors say you could count on Colin Ferguson showing up at this laundry mat every Sunday morning, and while others were arguing over washing machines, he didn't get involved. He kept to himself and waited his turn. This woman says Ferguson did not speak of racism, but often did feel Jamaicans were shown in a bad light as drug dealers instead of hardworking people. She showed us the pavement work Ferguson did on a neighbor's driveway last summer. Yeah, he's like an enemy man. And that can get frustrated. You go to a good school and then you come out to be doing this. There were more people than usual at regular Wednesday prayer service in Garden City's Cathedral of the Incarnation. They came seeking comfort to cope with tragedy. I used to sit on the train pregnant and sleep, and I never felt scared, and uh, it, it's just really shaken me up. Your Douglas your Rodriguez had been on the third car of last night's 533 train, seen the gunman shooting. He even caught a woman in his arms as she fell from a bullet in the neck. The woman that died that was in the front seat looked like she wasn't even shot, and she was dead, and it's like, why? How are you coping, though? You, you you seen day me by day. Day by day. The Long Island Railroad had counselors on the platform and train for commuters of the 533 who may need help. This morning, somebody offered counseling. I gave us cards on the platform, which I haven't availed myself of yet. I spent the whole day reliving it for everybody who called me in the office. Our counseling was also available at Garden City High School this evening. Douglas Rodriguez was among about 40 people who were told that stress is the normal reaction to this abnormal situation. 
The counselors say the stress may make it impossible to sleep or make you unusually jumpy or emotionally numb. They say the key to recovering and coping is managing that post-traumatic stress and they say it begins with talking about what happened. The other thing that you can do is to try to relax as much as possible and keep your routine of your life as much as possible also, the best that you can. Dr. Demaria says before any healing occurs, people must first deal with their own feelings by putting them in words and surrounding themselves with others who need comfort and support. In Garden City, Reggie Harris, Channel 2 News. The accused gunman wearing a bulletproof vest struggled with his handcuffs, glared at our camera, and then Colin Ferguson showed off his wrists he claimed were bloodied by court officers. Once inside Judge Donald Belfi's courtroom and after Ferguson was unshackled, the judge gave the word that so many victims and their families wanted to hear, there will be a trial. The defendant is not an incapacitated person and that he does not as a result of mental disease or defect lack capacity to understand the proceedings against him and to assist in his own defense. Ferguson seemed to take it all in stride. He calmly fired his lawyers, told the judge there would be no insanity defense, and then told attorneys Kuby and Kunstler he'd like them only to assist him in the trial if and when necessary. I believe that I can prove my innocence. I believe that I can be acquitted. And I believe that I can do a better job than just about anyone else. I believe there was a chilling moment when the judge reminded Ferguson he would be questioning would to, victims. You would have the opportunity and you'd be able to cross-examine witnesses. I'm looking forward to that. The idea of it is so horrible to contemplate that, uh, that it's just, it staggers the imagination because Colin Ferguson genuinely believes he didn't commit the crime, he didn't do the shooting, um, and, and everybody knows that he did. The victims are going to have to endure the rigors of a trial, unfortunately, and the further rigors of having to be cross-examined by the alleged shooter in this crime. Families who are still mourning loved ones killed one year ago and who gathered Wednesday at the scene of the shooting say it will be difficult. To have this man ask them questions, I can't imagine what they, they're going to have to go through. Had the judge found Ferguson incompetent, he would have been sent to a mental institution until doctors found him ready for trial. However, Judge Belfi said psychiatrists proved in court Ferguson understands right from wrong and therefore must face our criminal justice system. So the long-awaited trial will now get underway January 17th with the suspect himself leading his own defense. From Mineola, Long Island, Jennifer McLogan, Channel 2 News. There were 93 counts to that indictment. 93 counts only because it matches the year 1993. Had it been 1925, it would have been 25 counts. Security was tighter than it's ever been. Everyone wanted to hear what the accused gunman would tell the jury. Even the judge appeared surprised when Ferguson delivered his alibi. Colin Ferguson was in fact a well-meaning passenger on the train. Like any other passenger, he dozed off. Having the weapon in a bag, at that point, someone opened the bag, took the weapon out of the bag, and proceeded to shoot. It was 13 months ago that six were killed and 19 others injured when someone opened fire with this 9mm Ruger semi-automatic. It was difficult for mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, to see the photographs of their loved ones entered as evidence and to hear the passive words of the accused. We're not the judge. He's got to face a judgment that's going to be far greater than anything he's going to face here. By God's grace, we're bloodied survivors, but we're not vowed victims. That was the most difficult part of the, what was to hear my husband's name, that he was murdered. Not only did the families hear Ferguson tell the jury it's all a case of mistaken identity, but he added the case against him is a frame-up. This is a case of stereotype victimization of a black man and subsequent conspiracy to destroy him. The prosecutor said all 41 witnesses he will call will say that Ferguson was the gunman, beginning with the first woman who was shot, Mary Ann Phillips. Colin Ferguson asked the judge to subpoena President Clinton and former Governor Cuomo in this case. Request denied. This trial is expected to last two months. Reporting from Mineola, Long Island, Jennifer McLogan, Channel 2 News.
he looked me dead in the eye and pointed the gun and with the most serious look I have ever seen on anyone's face, he shot me in the chest. I immediately told myself I've been shot. I better protect myself and play dead, Marianne. Make believe you're a rag doll. Then after a while, the gunfire stopped. Then I heard someone, my eyes were not open, come back, stand next to me. I heard a fishing around. I heard a click. And then I heard the gunfire again. Then Ferguson, lawyer and defendant, faced his alleged victim. So you didn't see him because you were playing dead, am I correct? That's correct. Marianne Phillips said she couldn't get off the witness stand fast enough. I really sincerely hope that he is put in jail or an appropriate institution that never allows him to get out onto the street again. Earlier, Colin Ferguson caused spectators and families of the victims here today to shake their heads with another of his unusual requests of the court. At this point, I am moving this court for mistrial. Ferguson asked for a mistrial, which was denied because he wasn't allowed to touch the murder weapon in front of the jury. The judge said it was for security reasons. At this point, we're just watching him dig his own grave, basically. Uh, we just want to get through this and have justice served. It saddens me to see him not admitting any guilt whatsoever. There's no remorse, and that, that pains me a lot. On Monday, when the trial resumes, one of the three Long Island Railroad heroes who tackled the suspect is due to testify. There are murmurings that Ferguson may try to pin the crime on one of those three men. From Mineola, Long Island, Jennifer McLogan, Channel 2 News. Initially, I was... Uh completely scared out of my wits. Uh, the only thoughts that were going through my mind at the time were that I was going to be shot, that this wasn't fair uh, to my wife and to my children. And he was m moving methodically left and right shooting. And he was pushing a little bit further. And I can hear him say, you're going to get it, you're going to get it. I heard someone say, get him. And so I proceed to go forward. It slipped on some blood. And then uh, myself, Kevin Blum, and Mark McEntee, then we pushed him into uh, one of the aisle seats. I saw the gun in the, in the seat here. I picked it up, stuck it in my raincoat. We held him there. He, was, he yelled, don't hurt me. Then in a meandering, uh, at times incomprehensible uh, style, Colin Ferguson began yeah. chipping away at the testimony of what happened on that train 13 months ago, trying to discredit the witnesses. With a weak attempt at shifting the blame to Mark McEntee, the passenger who turned over the murder weapon to police. Were you exposed to the shooting at the time? that you say you turned around? Uh, no. You were facing west. I was looking at your back. Did there come a time when a police officer entered the train? Yes. And uh, where was the gun at that point, Mr. McAtee? In my raincoat pocket. Mr. McAtee. Why did you put the gun in your raincoat? because I didn't want you to get it again. At any time, did the police officers question you concerning this matter? Yes, they did. And uh, did they question you as to why you had a gun? They asked me if I picked up the gun, yes. And they, did they arrest you for any reason on any kind of suspicion? Uh, no, they did not. As Colin Ferguson, suspect and lawyer, arrived shackled this morning, his legal advisor, Alton Rose, wondered aloud for the first time if perhaps the judge in this case should rethink Colin Ferguson's competency and allow Rose to take over the case. The judge has ruled that Mr. Ferguson should represent himself. Now, in retrospect, I question that ruling. Probably should not have done that. Many watching the trial describe it as surreal. For one thing, you can often hear the sounds of the same Long Island Railroad train line just blocks from this courthouse. Today, the whistle was punctuated by the cock of the murder weapon as a detective showed Ferguson the gun he's accused of firing 30 times. Subsequent pulls would reload it until all 15 or 17 or 18 rounds would 
would be fired from this weapon. The suspect was not allowed to touch the weapon. The judge said it was for security reasons, but Ferguson did handle the exploded black talon bullets, turning them over and over in his hands. And while you're in that, without being an eyewitness to the scene of a crime, can you tell the identity of a shooter? No, yes the, no. no I cannot. And the unusual continued. Ferguson again was given the opportunity to cross-examine victims. And that's where reality sets in. This man came to the aid of Dennis and Kevin McCarthy. On the end was Kevin McCarthy with a bullet wound to the head and, and uh, quite a bit of bleeding. Can you describe that? He, he was sitting up in the seat, uh, a bullet wound to the right side of his head, uh, quite a bit of bleeding, but he was at that point still sitting up. Kevin McCarthy is now 27 years old. A cane in his right hand, limping ever so slightly, he slowly made his way toward Colin Ferguson's courtroom, averting his eyes from the dozens of reporters and cameras swarming him. One of the most dramatic moments of the trial was underway, and Kevin walked in to face for the first time the man accused of shooting him point blank in the head and killing his father seated next to him. I remember leaving Penn Station and then hearing an undistinguished sound. No, I did not realize I was shot. When is your next memory? Just awaking in the hospital. I lost an estimated 10% of my brain. Could you speak? I could make garbled noises, but my vocal cord, my left vocal cord was paralyzed, so I was going through speech therapy while I was in the hospital. Prosecutor George Peck entered Kevin McCarthy's medical records into evidence. They weighed several pounds. The suspect did not react when Kevin was asked about the death of his father, Dennis. When was the first time you found out about your father? When I was still in North Shore Hospital, because I had realized that he wasn't coming over with my mother. Then Colin Ferguson's shortest cross-examination of the trial. If there is any way whatsoever you can assist them in positively identifying the shooter on the train. No, I did not see the person that shot me. It was over, and for Kevin McCarthy, a sense of relief. Kevin was asked if he now plans to celebrate. Did you do anything this evening to kind of uh, unwind uh, as a result of uh, this entire buildup? No, but what I would, you know, just because you know, I'm on medication, I'm not allowed to go out and drink, but <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I, you know, go out and, you know, probably, you know, drink. <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> it's the long-anticipated opening day for the defense, but Colin Ferguson, moving at a snail's pace, was far from ready, I repeatedly asking the judge for more time yeah, to prepare his case. It's your time to have television interviews and tapes uh, with television uh, programs, which I believe could have been well served by you doing the work you intended to do over the weekend, as you indicated to the court. Well, I believe there was uh, an instance in which I spoke from the, the cell, and I believe that was for about five minutes by telephone. Yesterday, Ferguson uh, called us, Ray Collect, at CBS, and also phoned NBC. Tonight, he's scheduled to be on the program Larry King Live. Larry King will not be live uh, from NCCC, uh, but we are making arrangements uh, for them to conduct a uh, television interview this evening. Not to be outdone by talk shows vying for the suspect, among the more than 50 reporters and camera crews here for the first time today were booking agents from a number of tabloid TV magazine shows trying to pass notes into the accused gunman, eager to sign him up for a guest appearance. I think it's ridiculous. You're, it seems like you're glorifying someone who, who is murdered. It seems that the news media is, is really, and I don't mean everybody, is really sinking to a, a low here. One courtroom observer, a criminal expert, told me Ferguson seemed to enjoy his role taking center stage today, that it appeared he wanted to drag this case along, pointing to Ferguson's reluctance to produce his witnesses. We have uh, run into some problems concerning the ballistics, the handwriting expert. I'm told uh, of late that they are now very concerned for their lives to come forward and testify. Members of the jury, good morning. Uh, as you can see, I'm a little bit disorganized here. 
Hour after hour, Colin Ferguson rambled through an illogical, meandering statement that appeared to anger survivors and even some jurors. People that are injured are simply accepting whatever was happening and simply putting their signature to that particular statement. So all of a sudden, it becomes an identification. But where was the lineup? Where were the photographs? How many other people were like Kevin McCarthy who did not see the shooter? At least he was honest about it. Ferguson said a number of survivors lied on the witness stand, especially the railroad heroes. It, it bothered me. I lost sleep. I lost sleep over that because I said, how could a man bring himself to come into court and be so vindictive towards a person? The suspect suggested the real motive for testifying against him was money. What about the financial interest now that you're looking at a $2 million lawsuit? But perhaps even more bizarre, the sudden last-minute appearance of two mystery witnesses ready to testify that CIA agents planted a computer chip in the brain of the suspect and controlled his actions on the train that night, that just before it pulled into Maryland Avenue, Colin Ferguson awoke with a gun in his hand. A white man went into Mr. Ferguson's bag, and Mr. Ferguson woke up. And he started to struggle. Again, I, I don't mean it. The mystery witnesses never testified. Colin Ferguson was left on his own. To come back with a verdict of not guilty. Not guilty. That would be the most, the most joyful day, I believe. Will the defendant rise and face the jury? Rise and face the jury. Mr. Foreman, has the jury agreed upon a verdict? Yes. As to count one of the indictments, murder in the second degree, what is your verdict? Guilty. Inside the packed courtroom, it was difficult for survivors to hold back their applause. Outside, where dozens had stood vigil for weeks, they crouched around television monitors reporting the moment. Ferguson heard the words of guilty over and over for all 28 major charges against him. Six counts of murder, 19 counts of attempted murder, three weapons possessions. Colin Ferguson barely reacted, but his brow furrowed when court officers stepped up to handcuff him. Mr. Ferguson, would you like the jury called? Yes. The deliberations had gone on far longer than anyone dreamed, especially the victims. Why do you think the deliberations went on so long? I don't think they went on that long. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the problem. I think they went through methodically this, the individual counts. They only got the, the case today at 11 o'clock. Colin Fer Ferguson, the person I knew um, back from Jamaica, was a decent, civilized human being. Um, when he came here, he had a number of problems, and of course, it probably was his inability to deal with these situations. In muffled tones, Ferguson announced his plans to appeal and was escorted out of the courtroom. A few moments ago, the 11-man, one-woman jury walked out of the Nassau County Criminal Courts building, past our cameras, saying they were not up to reacting tonight. When Colin Ferguson was taken out of the courtroom, the eruption of applause was from victims themselves and family members of those killed who filled the courtroom. Bob Giuliano was one of those shot on the train, shot in the chest and arm. I'd like to go home tonight before I have that drink and open my window and yell, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. For the surviving victims and family members, this was the night they'd waited for. Carolyn McCarthy lost her husband and her son Kevin was critically injured. Justice has been done, but I don't think you can ever say it's a happy occasion. When we have to sentence people to the mass murders, that are going around in this country. There were as many as 40 people directly affected by the shootings who were in the courtroom, who then spilled outside to voice their approval of Ferguson's guilt 
and to use the opportunity to mount a united front against semi-automatic guns. The manufacturers, the, the gun owners, the people, they look for the almighty dollar. Enough is enough. It could be my wife, my daughter next time. It could be me again. Let's put an end to it. The group called upon gun manufacturers to be more responsible in their sales of guns and ammunition. Tom McDermott was shot in the shoulder. That no matter how delusional or paranoid or schizophrenic Colin Ferguson appeared during the six weeks of this trial, that up until 10 minutes ago, he would have still been eligible to buy the same type of gun with that same large capacity clip to kill the six wonderful human beings and wound the 19 of us. Jack Lo Cicero's daughter, Amy Federici, was one of those killed. Let's not put the lives of people based on dollars and cents. Let's get some sanity to our gun control. The phone was removed immediately after the verdict and my cell ransacked and overturned completely at around midnight immediately after the verdict. Colin Ferguson began day one of his unprecedented three-day sentencing with a litany of complaints. His wrists and ankles are shackled too tightly. His hand has a cyst. He has gout and was too sick to properly prepare his motions asking Judge Donald Belfi to set aside the guilty verdict. He then admitted he never should have defended himself. The court asked me if in fact I was cognizant of the risks involved in going pro se. And I indicated yes. But there were certain things that I could not respond to. And there were certain things which now clearly show that I lacked the understanding. For example, Colin Ferguson complained that from the beginning, none of his lawyers shared crucial information with him about defense strategies. It was, I believe, on Channel 2 that I learned that Ferguson was insane by reason of black rage. Ferguson said that was a main reason why he decided to represent himself. He went on to claim that two of the Long Island Railroad victims lied and weren't even on the train that night. Ferguson said he wasn't given enough time to prepare his case and believes he'll get a new trial. His victims and their families are eager to have their chance to speak. And one of the things I know we're going to emphasize, both my wife and I, is who Amy was, to make sure that Colin Ferguson knows who he, who he killed. What are your hopes? That it goes quickly and painlessly and he gets the uh, maximum sentence allowed. Ferguson reiterated he fears for his life, asked to be put in total isolation while in prison, and compared his fate with that of the Wisconsin serial killer. In fact, Jeffrey Dahmer's death in prison was not coincidence, and that it was timed just moments before I was given the pro se status in anticipation of my trial beginning is a matter where it was setting the precedent for my murder in an upstate prison. I just want to indicate that. I think it's appropriate to begin by saying that this day is significant in a number of ways. I've it was one of the most dramatic moments of this long trial. Victims and their families could listen no more to what they called the insincere ramblings of a convicted killer. So only hours before sentencing, they got up en masse and walked out. That was a message that had to get through to him. You couldn't help but hear it as he tried to talk. Uh, the rumble of people uh, making a mass exodus uh, from the courtroom. And it was, it was definitely rewarding. With the courtroom nearly empty and victims gathered around our television monitors, Ferguson continued his lecturing. Uh, even though there was no specific comment made against me that would suggest that anyone specifically use race. This was one reason they didn't want to listen to him. Throughout this unprecedented three-day sentencing, Colin Ferguson fidgeted in his seat, ignoring them, showing absolutely no remorse, even at the most heart-wrenching moments. <laughs> the last victims to face Ferguson one final time today tried to send him a message. I consider myself extremely lucky for having survived along with my unborn child. I remember hearing you, Colin Ferguson, shooting your way up the aisle. I thought that my life was over and that I would never have the child I wanted so much. Finally, Colin Ferguson was told he had one last chance to talk. I hope that somewhere down the road, I will be forgotten. I will do my time on earth and I will go. It is a difficult place. But I will continue. Judge Donald Belfi, who'd been stoic throughout, delivered a stinging sentence. In my almost 21 years as a judge, 
I have never presided over a trial with a more selfish and self-centered defendant than you. The vicious acts you committed on December 7, 1993 were the acts of a coward. You, Colin Ferguson, will never again return to society, but rather will spend the rest of your natural life in prison. I'm going to put it to rest. And all I want to say is uh, to my wife, Donna, my three girls, Dawn, Dina, and Bobby, their father's coming home. Late this afternoon, the victims celebrated the end at a private party not far from the Maryland Avenue station where this all began. <laughs> okay, now we got one more.